Hello, my name is Professor John Harrison. I'm an experimental psychologist, and today I'd like to talk to you about cognition, behavior, plasticity, and the possibility that we might be able to train cognition. Let me start with neuroplasticity. So we've known for a very long time that the human brain is plastic. What do I mean by that? Well, plastic in the sense that in order to accommodate new information, there must be physical changes that go on in your brain. So if I tell you something new, if I tell you the capital of Outer Mongolia is Ulaanbaatar, and you remember that tomorrow, there have been changes in your brain to accommodate that new information. The strength of connections between brain cells, neurons, sometimes it might be about receptors on the end of neurons becoming opened up, proteins being synthesized. These are the events that go along with you learning new information. And that's what we mean by the brain being plastic. Now, we also know that the brain is differentially plastic at different parts of your life. So prior to puberty, there seems to be a lot of plasticity. Even in utero, there's clearly evidence of plasticity. People with disorders like tuberous sclerosis have problems with their brain development whilst they're still in the womb. And when they emerge, many of them don't realize that they've had tuberous sclerosis until they have children who are more profoundly affected. So the brain, even in utero, is developing in a very plastic way. Before puberty, there seems to be a lot of plasticity. Sometimes it's necessary to do surgical interventions where we reduce the threat of epilepsy. We can restrict the extent to which their fit becomes problematic by disconnecting parts of the brain. Even when we do this, roles that one part of the brain might usually do can be taken over by other parts of the brain. After puberty, there seems to be less plasticity, but you can still learn new information. So it's quite clear that there are elements of plasticity even within the adult brain. The element that's not really been looked at and exploited as much as we might is the idea that you can train your brain. Maybe there are things that we can do to enhance the connections between different locations, to enhance your abilities in various cognitive domains. I'm gonna to talk to you about cognition. So cognition is the activity of your brain, probably synonymous with the idea of a mind. So cognition happens in your central nervous system, your brain. I can't measure your cognition directly, but I can measure your behavior. And based on your behavior, I can make inferences and try to better understand your cognition. There are certain parts of the brain that seem to be very important for certain cognitive skills. And the reason that we can make purposeful distinctions between different elements of cognition is we occasionally meet people who have been unfortunate enough to have a brain injury, which means that they have a deficit in a specific area of cognition. So our evidence for the atoms of cognition that I'll talk to you about very shortly is that in different individuals, brain lesions can cause problems with specific aspects of cognition. Cognition is this idea of thinking, and we can divide thinking into some helpfully manageable lumps. A key one would be episodic memory. This is your memory for an event. So if you visited the cinema last weekend, you might have a memory for the film, who you went with, where the cinema was, maybe even some of the things that you had to eat and drink. Now that's an episode in your life episodic memory. And that contrasts with what we call semantic memory. Semantic memory is your knowledge for facts. So if I ask you the capital of France and you tell me that it's Paris, you probably can't tell me the first occasion where you learnt that information. So it's not an episode for you, it's part of your semantic memory, things that you know about the world. Another element of cognition is what we call working memory. But it's not really a form of memory. Memory implies that there's something you're trying to remember from past events. Working memory is really the term that we use to describe the space in your cognition where you solve problems. Let's think of an example of that. So if I ask you to take seven away from 100 and keep going, what do you have to do to achieve that? Well, you have to retrieve from your semantic memory the idea of 100, the concept of 100 and your concept of seven, and your concept of subtraction. And then you can use that information in your working memory to subtract seven from 100 and progressively tell me the product from each subtraction. So working memory is that element of your cognition where you solve problems. 
Another facet of cognition is really an umbrella term that we'll call executive function. Now this is a number of different elements to your cognition, but the things that we usually think about in this context of executive function would be your ability to plan ahead, to develop a strategy, to think outside the box, you really have to have elements of your executive function intact and working. There are some other elements to executive function. So one of the things that we can do is inhibit something that we'd really like to do. Imagine you're in traffic and you get cut up by another driver. You might want to shake your fist, you might even want to curse at them, but having the capacity to inhibit that behavior is an element of executive function. So executive function, it's an umbrella term, really means lots of different areas of cognition, but in common would be planning, organization, strategy, and the ability to inhibit a very potent response that you might like to make. And we also have the idea of psychomotor speed, how quickly you can respond to an event in your environment. So we would test this in a laboratory by showing you an image on a screen, and then you'd press a button to show that you detected that and made a response as quickly as possible. So psychomotor speed, another facet of cognition that we think is very, very important. It could be seen as a behavior. We're just measuring how quickly you do things. But I think we have an idea that your cognition is really two things, how accurate you are, how efficiently you deal with information, but also how quickly you can get to an answer. So those two facets, accuracy and speed, are the two things that psychologists are most interested in. And almost every test, every cognition test we have, focuses on either measuring accuracy or speed. Psychologists very rarely measure other things in the context of cognition. So, so far we thought about episodic memory, your ability to remember an event, and I've made a distinction between episodic memory and semantic memory. And we talked about working memory, which really isn't a type of working memory, it's much more about your ability to solve problems. So it's not a memory, it's a space where you do problem solving. Another facet of cognition is attention. So attention is your ability to focus on a specific area or on a specific element of a problem. Or if you're in a, a busy room, for example, maybe you're at a party and you hear your name, that can capture your attention. So we have this experience of attention being captured as well as being devoted to certain elements of your cognitive problem solving. Psychomotor speed would be the speed with which you respond to important events in your environment, either a dangerous event or an event that's holding you in preparation to do a new behavior. So these are the big areas of cognition. There are other things, praxis, your ability to manipulate objects, language, which is probably the output of all those other areas of cognition put together. But the big five would be episodic memory, executive function, psychomotor speed, working memory, and attention. So I've mentioned the possibility that it may be a potential for the brain that we can train cognition. And one way in which you might think about that is in the context of that atom episodic memory. So a very potent technique, it's been around for at least two and a half thousand years and probably longer, is to try to enrich your memory by making it imagerable. So visual elements to something you need to remember. And, and the example I always use when I go to schools is to say, here's a list of words, elephant, snowball, ukulele, scarf, skates, a list of usually about seven words, and I always say to the class, try to remember those words. And about five minutes later, I might ask people to tell me, how many of those words can you remember? And typically they'll say two or three. But if I then get them to do an exercise where they build a visual picture of a, an elephant playing the ukulele, wearing a scarf, skating, about to be hit by a snowball, they can use that visual image to much more effectively remember that information. Now, that's a very simple method for cognitive training. So the premise that you may improve cognition using a cognitive training technique is very well established. This was a technique that Greek orators would have used 500 years before Christ. So we, we have a good experience of being able to train cognition, so obviously recognized that it's been around for literally millennia. So that's the context of episodic memory. Maybe if I could practice your psychomotor speed, I could make you much quicker. 
Lots of people have heard about the learning curve. So they'll say there's a very steep learning curve on this task. And your speed of response in the context of psychomotor speed is a very good example of a steep learning curve. So if I gave you a task where you had to press a button on your computer every time you saw a light come on, to begin with, you'd be quite slow. But after a few trials, typically about 10 or 12 trials, you'd show your speed of response reducing very substantially. And there'd come a point where extra practice brings you a little bit of an improvement, but you're essentially at a plateau. So the learning curve in reaction time happens quite quickly. So with episodic memory, the clear techniques, with psychomotor speed the same, if I can train you to pay attention, so if I can encourage you to learn to better attend to a certain location, I can train your attention. So getting you to focus on a location where an event is about to occur, if I can improve your capacity to sustain your attention, I can potentially train that area of your cognition as well. So let's just recap on some of what's been discussed. So the brain is where cognition happens. And I can't measure cognition directly, but I can measure your behavior and that allows me to make inferences about your cognition. The brain is plastic. Learning new information, learning new strategies, means that there are changes in your brain that accommodate that new approach and that new information. Cognition can be divided helpfully into different aspects, the so-called atoms of cognition. Working memory, executive function, episodic memory, attention, and potentially psychomotor speed, really account for the five principal domains of cognition in the human cognition system. Praxis and language are also elements, but they're probably the end point of those five major domains working successfully in tandem to allow you to behave in the way in which you can get everyday tasks completed. So there are various aspects to human cognition that we know on the basis of very good evidence can benefit from training and the opportunity with cognitive training going forward is to exploit that technology to try to help people improve their cognition.